Thanks for downloading this episode from Teachers Talk Radio. You can find the full schedule and listen back to all our shows at ttradio.org. This show is brought to you in partnership with John Cat Educational, leading publishers of books, directories, educational guides and magazines aimed at schools in the UK and beyond. Enjoy the podcast. Hello and welcome to Teachers Talk Radio for The Late Show with Lucy Newberger. Uh, We're going to be kicking off in just a moment's time. Uh, Just before we do, just to say a massive uh, shout out to John Cat Educational, who sponsor this and all our shows. If you want to find out more about the new titles they've got available, just visit johncatbookshop.com and you can purchase uh, some of the best CPD titles in the teaching market space. So check that out, johncatbookshop.com. Also, just before I hand over to Lucy, um, a massive thanks to everybody for listening to Teachers Talk Radio shows. Um, We today reached 750,000 downloads. That's uh, three quarters of a million uh, downloads of Teachers Talk Radio shows since launch in 2021. So that's been an amazing achievement for the team and also a massive thanks to everyone for tuning in. I'm now going to pass over to Lucy for the show on Maths Mastery. Ah, oh, thank you, Mr. Rogers. Good evening, edgy folk. Lucy Newberger here for The Late Show. I'm back with you. I'm terribly sorry I abandoned you last week because it was my birthday. Uh, I did. I successfully completed another trip around the sun, as they say, And I had to go and eat curry and drink cocktails um, rather than talk to you all. So I'm really sorry about that. But it was good fun. Um, I wouldn't say I feel any wiser. I don't think 34 is a particularly big birthday, but feeling half good, I would say, today. So I'm really sorry if you can hear it in my voice. I am slightly bunged up. I was doing really well on the health front, but... It has got me and half my class as well are off sick too. It's it's those January blues, isn't it? It it seems to just, I don't know, post-Christmas catch up with, with all of us. But this evening we are going to be talking all things maths mastery um, with my lovely guest, Kira Mackle, who I'll get on with you in a moment. But before all that, and I've already kind of launched into my usual update before, Uh, before we've even got started but where to start well I think everyone is successfully back at school now we've we've got going the terms begun in earnest and I don't know about you but my year fives are a little bit manana at the moment they haven't really the engine hasn't really started as I said to a parent today when discussing one of their children uh, that we just we're we're kind of we're working on it we're 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 hoping to get a, a bit more energy going but at the moment it's it's not really there and I'm not sure why and actually one of my children turned to me the other day and said um Miss Newberger I don't know how you do this every day and I said well, well what do you mean and he said uh, I don't know how you have the energy to to stand in front of us every day like this and uh, there are many places my my answer could have gone and I'd be interested to know if any of you. Uh, what any of you would have would have said to that, but I just said I, I I enjoy being here and I like teaching you all. So I suppose that's where where my energy comes from. And I swiftly I swiftly moved on. Uh, so that was that. In other news, I uh, walked in this morning to um, uh, an email from my head teacher where uh, he'd had an email from a parent, and I'd accidentally um, put the wrong name in a comment in a report so I mean mercifully head teacher was very nice about it but I uh, felt very very silly on on that one so if any of you have ever made any mistakes like that please let me know and please make me feel better because that has never happened to me before I'm normally so good and so diligent in checking and triple checking quadruple checking my reports that uh that one slipped by me and the worst part was that um I'd sort of gone back into my archive for um some inspiration from my um old comments because some of the stuff I've taught this this year has been similar and uh, it wasn't even a child in the current class it was a child's name from one of my previous classes so 
yes, to add a little bit of insult to injury there. So that was my my mortifying moment of the of the day of the week, in fact. So you know, if you're feeling a bit rough around the edges, or if your uh, your starts term hasn't quite as been as as you hoped, at least you know you probably haven't done something like that. Uh, what else is going on? Um, I don't know really. Well, I suppose the big news this week is the teacher strike news so um for those of you in the uk it's been a a very interesting interesting time and it's going to be it's going to be intriguing to see how how it all pans out and uh, obviously the 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 various reactions on twitter have been very interesting to to see and of course as always, there is the kickback from those who are not a part of the teaching profession saying, you know, how dare we we go on strike and, and all the rest of it? How dare we uh, want want better pay and, and all the rest of it? And uh, I did think about putting a tweet out yesterday saying, for goodness sake, don't engage, don't rise to it. But I think I don't think that it warranted that. I think yeah, it's, a, you know, we're all intelligent enough to know that whenever something like this happens, there's always going to be some kind of, of kickback and there's always going to be some sort of reaction that, that we don't want to see. It's exactly as it was during COVID or whenever we dare to stick our heads above the parapet and say, hey, hang on a minute, things things aren't quite right here. We do need to to acknowledge that and the government needs to acknowledge that. So let's see. Let's see where, where we, we end up. But uh, I very much support the teachers that do plan to, to strike and uh, it'll be, well remains to see where where we end up afterwards but uh ah, so it's never dull that's all i can say um so i think that's it for my my weekly updates um what i will say is that i'm here sipping uh, herbal infusions i hope you've all got something lovely in front of you to drink some snacks and then we're going to get stuck into it so this evening's show is as always, it comes from, I say as always, a large part of the time, the, the shows that I end up doing are inspired by things that I want to learn more about. I say to you time and time again that Teachers Talk Radio is basically the best free, free CPD there is out there. So I often treat my show as the CPD that I would want if I had if I was in charge, if you like. And given that this is my show and that I'm in charge... I am choosing this evening to talk about maths mastery and unpick it uh, a little bit more, see where we're going with it, see, you know, the pros, the cons. And I have enlisted help and the lovely Kira Mackle has agreed to join me this evening to discuss this further. So I can see that he's there ready and waiting. And hopefully once he unmutes himself, his voice will come through loud and clear. So, Kieran, if you are able to do that... Oh, yeah. Good, good evening. Good evening Thank Kieran. you very much for having me. Uh, not a problem. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for being here and for uh, navigating the, the complex world of Twitter spaces to, to be with us. I hope it was, uh, it was all right for you. Yeah, not going to lie. That's the most nerve-wracking part of tonight. Is the, <laughs> I've never used spaces before. Um, so hopefully it's okay. I've also got my headphones in and I can feel them moving about. So if anyone's got any static, I'll take them out. Just let me know. No, you're coming through beautifully clearly. So I think from a from a technological point of view, we're we're doing we're doing quite well. So Kieran, before we go any further, what I'd like you to do is introduce yourself, your current role in education and your areas of interest. Awesome. I mean, I'm not very good at this bit. Uh, so I started teaching in 2008 and moved to Medway, which is on sort of Kent's north coast, and taught for close to 15 years in areas of high socioeconomic deprivation. Um, started as a teacher, assistant head teacher, deputy head. And then I got to the point where I thought I would like to stay focused on pedagogy. And lucky enough, this project with the Worshipful Company of Goldsmiths came along, where I got to support a number of schools who weren't federated or in a trust but they had a desire to raise outcomes so basically I got to work for five years with the, with teachers on their professional development and most recently in September I joined uh, La Salle Education and Complete Maths and I'm part of the maths team there and um, naturally one of my interests is mathematics um, but on a Saturday I have a podcast uh, called Thinking Deep About Primary Education and we just uh, chat about things that are of interest to us, much like yourself, the CPD that we'd want to, uh, we'd want to receive. We try and provide that uh, talking to really interesting teachers. 
Oh, that's fantastic. And, and a great introduction. Actually, I um, I have taught in, in Medway as well. When I still lived in the UK, um, I taught in Gillingham for, for a while. And uh, I'm actually from Kent originally as well. So uh, so I uh, the area that you that you described, I'm I'm also familiar with. So uh, it's good. Good to know. Good to know. That's when they recruited me. They they told me about Oliver Gillingham Football Club and how it's this wonderful football club. <laughs> and then I, and then I got I got to Priestfield, and I thought, hmm, <laughs> I've been, I'm oh, gone here. you've got to be careful because the the Jills fans are are diehard. I mean, it it might not be the the greatest place in the world, but uh, I've got friends of mine uh, in the UK, guys I used to work with, who would who are quite quite die hard die hard fans and will not have a bad word said against it so you you are you are brave my friend to to even to even go there and uh to get the football chat in as well i know tom rogers will be very happy about that because he tries to sneak it into pretty much every show he he does so uh so he'll be getting i'll be getting a a well played for that uh, as well but back to the matter in hand this evening so um when i was thinking about the show because maths is uh, a very key interest uh, of mine as as well I was that kid at school who struggled with it all the way through and I think I'm I'm sure I've told this story numerous times on this show but it's um, when I teacher trained I had a brilliant maths tutor who changed the game for me completely and kind of ever since then it's been a a focal point and something that I've wanted to to teach better. It's something that I've uh, explored in a, in a lot of detail. I'm on the curriculum team at school for it. So uh, unpicking all this this evening and exploring it further is going to be great for, for me and I hope for you and I hope for all the others listening as well. So let's get into it, Kieran, shall we? I've also got... Um, you're not familiar with this because I uh, <laughs> don't think you've listened in before, but I very much enjoy a research rabbit hole, as I call them. So you'll probably hear bits and pieces of paper shuffling around, which are various things that I will put in my show notes. But uh, it's all the kind of bits and pieces of research that I've done and um, will kind of chip in as as we chat, really. So. To those who are or to the uninitiated, those who are not familiar with it, in your mind, what is mastery? Kind of where did it come from, and how, in your mind, have we arrived at maths and maths mastery? Kind of being a term that you hear a lot in primary schools on a daily basis. Yeah, I think in my mind is really important because I can only speak to my view. Um, and I think, you know, mastery in particular is quite a hotly contested topic. Um, but the view that I subscribe to is that it originated in ancient Greece and with Plato and the idea that the best way to sort of tutor someone is in this one-to-one relationship. You know, you get your highest gains when you, uh, when you work one-to-one with someone. But essentially with the industrialization and sort of the, the changing shape of of how our sort of towns and cities became socialized. We needed to try and replicate that with a one to 30 ratio. Um, and so I think it was an Illinois turn of the 20th century. You had um, people like Washburn researching this mastery model of schooling. And so essentially the idea was that you would have um, sort of really in-depth prerequisite testing find out exactly what maths the pupils needed to learn. You would have high quality instruction on that mathematics. And then you would try and diagnose had the learning taken place. And then you would put correctives in place where it hadn't. And essentially you try to move, you know, these children along as if they are in a one-to-one relationship when really, you know, it's 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 much larger than that. Um, and so when I when the research talks about mastery. It talks about the work of Benjamin Bloom, who is more famous, probably wrongly so, for his uh, his taxonomy. Um, but actually, he sort of did a lot of research um, in the middle of the last century about uh, about this mastery model. And Thomas Gusky has sort of taken on that mantle since then. And essentially, they talk about this uh, this two sigma problem, where you've got your standard deviation of sort of progress in a class and how you can move it closer um, to the the one-to-one relationship and so when i talk about mastery though those elements the prerequisite testing the high quality direct instruction 
the um, sort of the diagnostic and then uh, corrective, you know, they all need to be in place for, in my opinion, to be the, the the mastery model of schooling to be uh, to be in place. If that makes sense, um, and so probably around about two thousand and ten, I think uh, when the United Kingdom was trying to do a lot of work with uh, China in terms of trade, there was a lot of exchange between teachers and schools um, in China and uh, Southeast Asia and the UK. And so the term mastery sort of made its way into the, the popular lexicon. Um, the, the, the debate, so to speak, is about whether or not uh, that mastery and mastery as Thomas Gusky would define it are, are the same thing. I think it's probably um, become a proxy for high quality math teaching but when I use the term mastery, I'm talking about a model of schooling that can apply to any subject and probably should apply to, to most, if not all. Oh, most definitely. And when you talk about China and Southeast Asia, that was where I first came across it as well with the idea of, of Singapore maths and, and things like that. And uh, I didn't really kind of understand what this was about. All I knew was that in schools in China and around Southeast Asia, children were being taught in in huge great classes often and uh, that I had a very almost, I suppose, a stereotyped idea of, of how teaching and, and instruction works. And I thought, oh my gosh, well, how does that uh, apply to maths? Because surely, you know, you need more than just someone standing at the front of the class de- delivering and, and, and children kind of copying things down. But of course, there's, there was so much more to it than that. But um I think you're right. I think that it's it's something that's kind of taken on a life of its own, often as these things do in, in education. And when I was kind of trying to, to piece together a, a definition in, in my mind, I sort of looked at, at various things. And actually, the I, I wanted to understand the idea of when you've mastered something, what does that actually mean? And I looked through various things and actually... Um, White Rose, this is a blog from White Rose, there are many other math schemes available I should say as well, but they describe it as a um, as a kind of ongoing journey that they kind of keep building upon and keep building upon and uh, that you never really sort of get to the end, that it's uh, that it's just kind of keeps going and you know, that true mastery, not that it's never achieved, but it's kind of it's sort of over there as opposed to kind of the, the, the ultimate the ultimate goal and I wonder what your, your feelings about that are. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you, you never perfect something, you know. And if you think about, you know, where the, this terminology sort of comes from, you think about the Renaissance and the, the idea that a masterpiece was the first piece that uh, like an artist would have done before they became independent of their of their master, so to speak. Um, and so, you know, even they acknowledged that, you know, you can create a masterpiece but you've still got a long career. So I, I can't remember exactly what <laughs> Da Vinci's masterpiece was, but it was phenomenal. And then he goes on and has this, this really prolific career in many, many different fields, you know? So, I mean, I, I, I love to learn in my own spare time as well. Um, and some of the things I feel, oh, I'm really good at this, but actually have I mastered them? You know, I, I think I could spend the rest of my life and, and not. So yeah, I'm, I'm totally with you on that one. I also heard it described uh, at one point as a child kind of really, mastered and again i'm using the term loosely here really mastered or understood something if they can then teach it to somebody else they can turn to a child next to them or to a person next to them and say you know actually from kind of the ground up teach them teach them how to do something or explain how to do it would you say that that's kind of in keeping with with a with a mastery definition or or not i mean i think that should be the minimum expectation for pupils um, you know, because if they really understand something, they're going to be able to explain it to someone else. Mm. Um, and so, you know, I, I wouldn't necessarily say they've mastered something, but they've, they've potentially understood it. And, um, you know, you, you see it in maths quite a lot where um, sort of pupils who appear to be really good at maths, they get the, the richest problems and they get the, the, um, the, the opportunity to reason, the opportunity to generalize. Um, but really, I think, you know, that everyone should have those opportunities. And so I wouldn't necessarily... Uh, it does fit into the, the field of mastery. 
I mean, we'll dig into this further when we kind of really look at, at the at the pros and cons. So we've sort of looked briefly at the the kind of history of where where we think this whole concept came from. We did a kind of brief rundown of that, and we sort of started to talk about how it found its way into the curriculum. And as you say, I my first hearing of it kind of came from that from that model of, of Singapore maths and, and things like that. But where I've really noticed it is that now in almost every school I mean I'm based in in Lisbon in in Portugal but almost every school I hear about in in the UK almost all of them are using some kind of and I'm going to put this in inverted commas mass mastery scheme it seems to this explosion particularly in the number of schemes that are available has just it's just I've never seen anything like it and I know they're fads and things that go in education but this this whole idea of, of maths mastery or mastery particularly within the subject of maths has doesn't seem to be going anywhere anytime soon and uh i just wonder how you feel about how these schemes have taken off and whether i mean i know that uh you you have uh, you do have very strong feelings on this so um are you in a school that is uh, or have you worked in schools that have used these schemes or is it something that you have tried to avoid yeah, I mean, I think the inverted commas are really important because um, a curriculum can't be a mastery curriculum and a, a scheme can't be a mastery scheme. Like I say, if you subscribe to the view that it's a it's a model of uh, of schooling, you know, there's so much more than, than the curriculum is just sort of one part of it. And, and essentially, you know, with poor implementation, you could have the absolute best curriculum in the world um, and not, not nothing much would come of it. Um, I think... If it were to be used as a proxy for effective teaching, I think what lots of people appear to be doing is trying to take some of the strengths of high quality curricula across the world, some of the pedagogies that are employed in those um, in those nations or those jurisdictions, and they are trying to um, sort of bring them to a different market. Um, now, I think that can only be a good thing because we're thinking about our our pedagogy, we're thinking about how we want to introduce people to the mathematics. Um, and so if that does bring about meaningful um, sort of change in pupils, then it can only be a good thing. You know, I, I don't think it's necessarily worth me splitting hers with them over whether it's mastery or not. Um, but, you know, um, I think if, if it's effective mass teaching um, and if it promotes sort of things that research has shown can be effective in the classroom, then I think we're halfway to uh, to developing our, our education system. Um, what I often see, um, having had the chance to talk to lots of educators and spend time in lots of schools, is that when implementation, you know, and, the, and the, I know you're going to get this later on, the company CPD falls short, um, you end up in a situation where the scheme will change every couple of years um, because, and the scheme or the curriculum gets the takes the blame essentially when really we need to think about well how are we supporting our teachers in effectively utilizing this because you can't take what people do in singapore and i'm very lucky i got to go to singapore with uh, three other teachers in 2018 and we spent a week there visiting schools visiting the national institute of education talking to them about what it made and um, singaporean mathematics and, and the teaching of mathematics really special um, and actually it all came down to the idea that it was, it was this micro system because of the way that Singapore is, the fact that it, you know, rightly or wrongly, it's had one party in power for upwards of 70 years, and the fact that they have no natural resources, and so the, the people and are their main export, you know, the, the, the education of the, of the people is it's essential to the, their success as a country or as a city-state. Um, and so you cannot just take that out um, and hope that it will plunk it down in, say, Medway, for instance, without um, thinking really deeply about how we support our teachers in enacting the, the, the curriculum. So a lot to unpack there, um, you know, but anything that makes mathematics teaching better um, and gives teachers a better opportunity to support their pupils, I think it can only really be a good thing. This show is brought to you in partnership with John Cat Educational, a leading publisher of books, directories, educational guides and magazines specifically aimed at forward-thinking schools in the UK and beyond. 
Have you checked out their latest releases? Don't miss out. Visit johncatbookshop.com to explore their full range of titles and advance your own professional development today. Happy reading. There's so many things I, I want, to, want to come back to that you've all already touched on, so I mustn't forget about them. But I just wanted to say hello while we're here, because lots of people have joined us in the space this evening who are very keen to listen to what you've got to say, Kieran, which is great. So who have we got here? We've got Shan uh, Doherty's joined us. We've got uh, Christopher Such is in, which is a, a, a huge privilege. So good evening to you, Chris. Uh, we've got Morgs in. We've got uh, Lloyd Williams Jones is in. Fantastic to have you here. Who else? So we've got um, Maria, we have got um, Alex as well. So lots of people listening in. So good evening to you all. And I hope that so far it has uh, grabbed your attention. It certainly has mine. So I'm uh, keen to get stuck in a little bit more. So, Kieran, I'm going to kind of talk from my sort of my, my own experience. And also what I should say to the people in the space, that if you do want to jump in and share your thoughts at any point, you can request to speak. There is a request button at the bottom of your space on the, I believe it's the left-hand side. So if you do want to leap in at any point, please feel free to. Please ask questions. Please also tweet any questions as well, and we will get those in too, because this is uh, for you, and it's we're learning together. So... We at uh, my school recently took on one of these schemes and initially I thought, OK, fantastic. This is this is going to be a, a, a really, a really great thing. It's, it's all there, if you like. It's all to an extent provided to you and, uh, you know, fantastic. And so in that respect, the fact that you have a scheme to work from, in theory, it makes things uh, a little bit easier. But of course, it quickly dawned on me that actually there are holes in this and there are issues with it. So as much as, you know, the idea that you've got, for example, the, you know, the concrete pictorial and abstract approach, I like that idea. But the difficulty I've had in uh, year five, for example, is that children haven't been taught like this since year one, we had a, a different scheme previously that didn't subscribe to, to this whole approach. And so it's almost complicated things for my class because they they're so used to almost the fluency side of it, being able to do those calculations without really having gone through the process beforehand. But what became very clear is that, yes, they can do the process, but they can't explain the intricacies of that process to me it's almost just kind of a, a, a mechanical mechanical aspect and I just wondered your your thoughts uh, on that on uh, one of the many holes that I'm going to to want to explore in this in this whole approach and if, if you've ever experienced something similar in your teaching I mean this is this is one of the implementation sort of questions mm. um, because I know that we want things to be better right now mm -hmm. But a, a long-term prudent approach often bears more fruit. Um, I'll, I'll give you an example directly from my, from sort of my experience. Um, in 2017, 2016 maybe, me and a head teacher who I would go on to work for were exploring the options in terms of high-quality textbooks. Um, and we both decided in two separate schools to get the same high-quality textbook. Now, I wanted everything. So this is 2015. I wanted everything right there and then. I wanted all my teachers from year one to year six to use it and use it well. He decided that he was going to have his year one teachers and his year three teachers use it in year one. Then one, two, three, four in year two. Add five in year six or, and, or in the next year and then add year six the year after. Um, now, I had a lot of stressed teachers. He's still effectively using that high quality textbook um, now. Um, and so, you know, despite um, having reasonable experience in mathematics, I was a little naive in how things could be implemented. And um, so I would always recommend to people that you start slowly, you get early adopters. You know, for instance, your year one and your year three teachers in that scenario, they become the people who talk to the year. Um, four teachers and the year two teachers the year after and um, you know and by the time you get to year six 
they're actually asking, can we can we make this change now? Because everybody else is having lots of fun planning from this and 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 we want to get involved too. I also think it speaks to what I see as the most important part of teaching, um, and that's thinking. Um, I think the bulk of what we do should be thinking. And so if you have something in place that allows you to outsource some of the thinking, like, for instance, the order in which you're going to teach things. I always talk about in 2008, we had the national strategy, and I had to decide the order. And that order could have been totally different every year if I'd wanted it to be. Um, whereas if you have something in place that will sort of, here's, the, here's the, the general sequence, I can focus my attention on, well, what happens if I need to put correctives in place? So I spoke about the importance of correctives, make sure everybody moves along at the same pace. Well, I, I know where the deep, I can think about the detours. I could think about the resources I'm going to use. Um, and so you're absolutely right. There's no way you can pick something up and it will be right for every group of 30 children across the country. Um, what you need to do is you need to spend your time thinking about your practice. And so your, uh, your planning preparation assessment time becomes less about what am I going to teach? What activities will I use? And it becomes about, well, how can I stretch those pupils who need to be stretched and how can I um, how can I support um, pupils who need more support? Because I think one of the fundamental things that I sort of omitted earlier on when I talked about what is mastery, it's, it's based on this fundamental belief that the vast majority of pupils can attain well with, in, with sufficient time and support. And so I think that speaks to this, you know, because if I have a really high quality option in front of me, well, then I can spend my time thinking about the stuff that's really, really important in the classroom. I think that's that's really interesting. And so, I mean, my understanding, again, is that these um, these schemes and this this idea of teaching is uh, often whole class teaching. And I am usually on my own in in class and uh, which with uh, with 18 is not not so bad. But I find that. I've got um, children who don't really often need that much input from me, but are having to kind of sit through uh, sort of some of it at least. And then I've got the children who are really finding things things quite tricky. I mean, in, in any class, you've got that broad that broad spectrum of of things. And then the the idea that you know you've got, I suppose, the difficulty in a way is that everyone should be exposed to everything including that that reasoning and problem solving side of of schemes which were, which is you know once you kind of get past the fluency once you've got that now then you can start that that application of really kind of getting into the nitty gritty of applying that knowledge and really kind of in theory achieving that inverted commas mastery but i often find that there are children who are not not getting that exposure who are not not getting through the right amount of fluency and so they're kind of not getting the exposure that I would want them to to those more uh sort of the, to those deeper questions how how would you as a teacher get get around that because that is something that I think is a is a big problem and that, yeah it's really important I think my pre my view of it is that I'm always considering who really needs my input the most in this situation because I, I think of children I've taught in the past, as you say, they probably didn't need that lesson, um, whereas the children needed probably more of the lesson. And so I would be a lot more fluid in what was happening in my class so that I could provide more time for those pupils. Um, now, over-practicing things is still, something, is still a value. So, for instance, if, if you think a pupil might know something, I want them to really demonstrate that they did and then I would ask them to explore a really rich task from Enriched Maths, for instance, um, because I've set pupils' tasks from, from that website, and it's taken them two weeks to find a sufficient response. And um, There's really one good one on a phenomenon known as French decimal time, because obviously during the French Revolution, uh, they tried to sort of standardize everything. You know, that's when we had um, sort of the introduction of the uh, the metric system, but they also try to utilize that with time. And so in Rich, they give you a, they give you a time in what we would use to tell time is base 60, and then you would have uh, the French decimal time. And they wanted to, they want the pupils to explore and explain how French decimal time worked and 
based on the information that they were given, which is not a lot of information. Um, and so I'd ask those pupils, you know, if I was 100% certain that the content of my instruction was not necessary, I would like you to come back to me with uh, a sufficient explanation. Um, in other situations, I'll ask them to explore towards generalization. In, in my most recent book, Thinking Deeply About Primary Mathematics, I outline sort of four key um, stages on the journey towards mathematical proof. Because I know when I think about when I start teaching, what I ask people for proof and what proof actually is at primary um, were two different, very different things. So I thought, well, I'll help teachers by here's a roadmap through towards proof. And so the, the big kicker is that to find a mathematical proof at primary, it takes a whole lot of hard graft. In fact, most of it, 99% of it is probably, I think it's a John Lennon quote, or someone misattributed to John Lennon, but 99% perspiration, 1% inspiration. And that's, you know, so they can focus on that. I know that they're going to come to this great realization at the end of that. And then I can focus on those pupils who are, who are struggling. Now, another way that I've seen this work really well is in the STEP Academy Trust. Um, and so they're always sort of welcome to visitors. And, um, but they have intervention immediately after um, their uh, maths lessons. And so SLT will take assembly, intervention can take place. And so then those pupils will, you know, sit in a time as the most important variable, will receive more time. And I know that they use Engelman's uh, sort of direct instruction in intervention when pupils need more than just sort of that same day intervention. So. That would be my, um, it would be prioritizing because if I think of my own children, um, I'm thinking they probably need less instruction than some of the children I've taught in the past. Mm -hmm. But I think the idea that we want all of our pupils to see this richness, I think there are ways that you can balance it so that they all do, but just some of them get your attention more. And that's not necessarily a bad thing but if you structure the enrichment tasks in, in such a way that they're also really deepen in their understanding of a mathematical concept. So, I mean, what, what I'm understanding from you is because I think as well, when these, when these shiny schemes, and I'm not critical of them because I, I, you know, I've, I've used them and all the rest of it. And I do, I should say, you know, that I, I do think that they have, they have plus points. And I do think the kind of the, the heart of them is in the right place, but the idea that you can uh, do nothing other than whole class teach and you know all these children will get them to where you want to be is incredibly whimsical and dare i say it dangerous because from what you've said is that yes you've got your maths lessons and and there's lots of moving parts to that but also you've got to have that intervention you've got to have maybe even some some pre-teaching for some for some children as well in order for this to be in any way effective is is that what you're what you're getting at yeah, I think the distinction is between how it used to be and we had to have six different activities, potentially six different mathematical concepts, mm -hmm. all on the go at the same time in class. I mean, I always joke about it. I had her when I started teaching and after a year and a half, I did not have her <laughs> because of the amount of planning and preparation that I was doing. Um, and, you know, that. so I think it's a bit of a misnomer, you know, because everyone's moved in the same direction along the same content, but some pupils need more time. And that, that, that's sort of how you structure your class. And, you know, one of the big things we have to get over as a profession, and we still aren't over it, um, is the idea that we have to race through the curriculum, you know, because yeah, I, I've seen this happen where in for five years, um, this, the curriculum didn't start in September. You know, we didn't start teaching maths in September, but by the time you get to the end um, of that curriculum, it was February in year six. So for instance, say these kids started Christmas in year three, and then by the time they got to year six, they'd covered everything we wanted them to cover by February. You know, there, there's more than enough time because the better you do early on the, um, and the, the stronger those connections early on, the, the bigger the gains later on down the line. Things take less effort if you do things really well earlier on. So if you get a really rich early experience, um, and speaking of someone who's worked in schools where we had to almost act as a surrogate for, for the absence of parental engagement at a young age, um, you know, we took our time. We didn't expect pupils to start formal and um, what might be considered formal mathematics until the Christmas of year one. So that we made sure that everything that a pupil needs to understand and to have a sense of before they begin to engage with formal, well, I don't know if formal is the right word, but there's a distinction between the mathematics that's innate to an infant 
and the mathematics that the school mathematics because school mathematics is biologically secondary whereas early mathematics a lot of the time is biologically primary and so i'm, I'm going off on a massive tangent here but essentially um slow down there's plenty of time do things right early on and then you have fewer and fewer and fewer pupils needing intervention later on um, and you have increasingly homogenous groups you know i don't think i've ever seen a completely homogenous group partly because mo mobility plays a big factor sure. um, and and so you know but if you're looking at the the bigger picture the broader picture across your school you're thinking okay these these children are much more proficient in mathematics than they than they would have been um, 10, 15 years ago. No, and also, Kieran, never worry about a tangent. As I said to you when we spoke prior to the show, we we, we, we love a tangent. We absolutely love it. And it's 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 kind of the whole point because you know it's 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 opening up the conversation much further. I'm just looking at something that's uh, in front of me, one of my many pieces of paper, and this is from um Dave Benson, actually, who I think lectures at University of Derby, I believe. And just looking at some of the, the, the pros and cons linked to mastery and linked into to what we're saying here, uh, I think there is a, certainly a misconception that I had, if you like, that, oh, well, you know, here, here are the workbooks. Here is uh, this lovely shiny scheme in front of me. And, OK, I'm going to deliver this. And that's and that's great. And there's no well, I was going to say there's no obvious differentiation in it, but there there's there is there's no differentiation, period. You kind of if you are sticking to using workbooks or using the, the the worksheets that are provided it is just that I mean yes okay you know it might differentiate according to, to how much they do but again at the same time you've got children who will just do one or two questions and then you have got those children who you are going to need extension after extension for because they're just going to to whiz through so that differentiation still has to has to be there as, as part of mathematical learning as far as I'm concerned because otherwise you're just uh, you're going to almost uh, not be able to the the ones who find it trickier are not going to to move forward in the way that you want them to and are going to lose that confidence and at the other end the ones who are really quite good are going to get bored and fed up with you because they're just kind of being flung you know stuff that they can already do so I think that yeah the 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 being mindful of that differentiation is is, is so important if you're going to if you're going to be using these schemes or if you're going to be well teaching full stop yeah, I mean, differentiation is another word that's uh, completely loaded because mm. lots of people use it in lots of different ways. Sure. Um, but yeah, but, but I think, yeah, you're thinking about scaffold and challenge. You know, those are the, those are the two things, you know, you've got to consider. Um, and actually, when we're talking about thinking about your practice and you, whatever you've got to support you, um, I would sit with uh, I would sit with my teachers and we'd have a post-it note and we'd look at the sequence of questions because often the questions are sequenced in such a way that they'll reveal the mathematics to the pupils through your instruction. And we'd say, we'd ask ourselves, well, where are they going to get stuck? You know, and obviously, if you've taught year three for 10 years, you know exactly where they're going to get stuck. And if you've taught for less than a year, a year, um, you're, it's all brand new to you. And, and so we'd sit with the post note, we'd say, okay, I, what is it about the structure of this question is difficult? I'm going to write four or five more. Because then in the moment, I'm ready to ask more questions that go beyond the resources that I have available. And because... What you don't want is to go. Okay, well, that's the end of that's the end of that question. We'll have to come back to this. And equally, if you're less experienced, you don't want to be thinking about this on the spot. And um, you know, you almost you make it look as if you are. And you think, okay, well, how would you answer this question? You're sticking up your whiteboard. Um, so yeah, so that's the kind of thinking that that I think we should do. Um, but yeah, but uh, yeah, scaffolding challenges. I, I try to avoid the word differentiation, but I totally see where you're you're coming from yeah i mean it's it is a it's like all these words in education it is a it is a loaded word and i couldn't think of a sort of better way to articulate it in in in, <laughs> in, the, in the heat of the moment but i i hear exactly what what you're what you're saying um the other thing i wanted to just circle back to because uh i'm worried that my brain will go off on a tangent is i was speaking to a to a year two teacher recently and uh she said to me that I mean, her argument would almost be that there should be no writing down of anything, no sort of uh, worry about about calculations and, and things like that until, you know, a, a little bit later. I mean, arguably, maybe year two is uh, a bit too late. I don't know how you how you feel about that. But it should be, as you've talked about, that that exploration, that using of uh, different objects, different things and actually figuring out 
how numbers and how and the value of things and how things work and then it can be moved on to the more complex pictorial and abstract approaches so uh, I don't know how you feel or when you feel that the the written stuff if you like should should come into should come into play I think it depends where she's going if if it's just general secretarial skills in mathematics I think this what's one way people can express meaning you know very early on you want them to represent what they think the numerals should be before you before you introduce the the numerals themselves and um, but what I think your colleague is talking about is the use of the formal written algorithms in key stage one um, and I'm 100% with her if that is the case because they are you know there are many mental methods which are much better suited to developing people's understanding of arithmetic um, and particularly the field axioms and how uh, sort of different uh, parts of mathematics relate to each other um, and I could quite happily go the whole way through year one or two without ever asking people to use the the former written algorithm and in fact it was probably the very last thing that we uh, that we would explore in, in my last school um, and so you know there, there was no document I was talking about this uh, it was, what was it called it was called um, helping children to calculate mentally or something along those lines I'll, I'll try and retweet it because they archived all this stuff and essentially it goes through all the different things like near doubles addition through subtraction um, you know subtraction through addition and um, all, all the different ways that you can think about number that prevent you from, you know, when you're near six and you do the, uh, what is it, 10,000, you know, or is, is 10, uh, the one where they, they regroup lots and lots of times to make it into 9,999 when actually you can just sort of uh, manipulate it mentally instead. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm 100% with you there. I think uh, more time and having your curriculum focus on what those methods are when they should be introduced and then spiraling around them with increasing the large numbers. So for instance, year one, maybe use numbers to 10 and numbers to 20 at most numbers to 40 numbers to hundred and year, year two. Um, but never really any further than that when you're, when you're thinking about enumeration and arithmetic. Um, and so, yeah, that, 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 yeah, that, that, that's where I would come at this from. And so I'd be more than happy if I didn't see it. Um, and I know people feel that they, perhaps needed because of the, the way the moderation system is set up. Um, but I think as long as you get the response correct, um, and I've seen children do the whole of the, uh, of the reasoning paper in their, in their heads, so it, it is possible, um, but uh, they need a really good grounding in what, uh, what arithmetic is and how they can be flexible with arithmetic. Um, and if you're talking about research papers, there's a paper by, from 1994 by Tall and Gray, and they talk about perceptual reasoning um, and this idea that uh, those pupils who don't see the connections between the big ideas work twice as hard for half of the payoff. Um, so I advise anybody to read that paper um, because it massively influenced my thinking. Um, and, it, and it speaks to the idea that, OK, we know the algorithm, but we're having to go through many, many more steps. You know, all this regrouping and, and sort of uh, manipulation, um, whereas we could choose a, a more efficient and effective method i think it's, it's interesting that uh, you mentioned the research papers and, and or the content of that research paper because i think as well in in maths we forget just the 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 whole or the number of cognitive processes that children are, or any of us when we're doing these things are, are having to to go through and it's uh, it's enormous and that actually all this knowledge builds on itself and i think that as you say, it's, it made me think about the, the, the speed and the kind of what we think we should do. And there's still so much of that in teaching. Well, you know, we need to prove that in case inspectors come knocking that, that children can do these things. Well, how do we do that? Well, you've got to, you know, have things in books and you've got to have it written like this. And it's, it's, it's sad in a way. And I think this is also part of the reason that people, people, children go off maths so early and, that it becomes less of a favorite subject because it hasn't had, or they haven't had that chance to explore things. They haven't had, it's all been a bit too formal, if you like. And it's instead of having that time to, to look at things differently and to really understand how these, how these things work. And uh, I think that there's still an enormous fear, particularly if, uh, with teachers who teach the younger years, feeling that they have to almost skip so many steps rather than enjoying the journey alongside the children that they're teaching. 
Yeah, I think I think it comes down to insecurity because if you're doing stuff so that there's evidence um, that something has happened, I think you know probably not the best approach to teaching and learning, um, and and it, it's usually born of a sort of insecurity in your subject knowledge, pedagogical content knowledge, um, and and really I think what we're looking for is um, yeah the the space like you said, to allow the pupils to explore mathematics. And um, I'm trying to think the best way to put this, but I mean, one person who's really good on this is a guy called John Starr. He talks about um, adaptive expertise um, and he will do research on which is the most efficient method to use. Um, I know that Michael Pershing has uh, has tweeted lots of threads about pupils' uh, method selection. Um, and I've gone so far off on this tangent that I've forgotten what the point I was trying to make is. But I think we need to um, make sure that we understand the the journey that we want our pupils to go on. Um, because if we do, then we'll know that the thing they're learning now is connected to two stops down the line. And the proof that they've learned this is in the pudding down here. Because mathematics is generally a hierarchical subject and the things that happened in the past impact on the things that happen in the future um, and I'm, I'm pretty impressed that I managed to get back to what my original point was because I, I didn't think I was going to at one point there oh no Kieran honestly if it makes you feel any better you make me feel better because my brain does exactly this and I'll kind of go off talking about something it happens on the show a lot and somehow we end up circling back around so please do not do not worry it is part and parcel of the of the journey of this show <laughs> in general so <laughs> i'm uh, i'm i'm pleased that you got there but speaking of reading material i just want to remind listeners of our delightful sponsor john cat education who publish a variety of fantastic books in the educational sphere if you look in the top of the space there is a lovely pinned tweet and at the moment, we have got Mr. Barton's uh, Maths um, Epic Tips for Teachers, and that is currently 632 pages, so you might need both hands, unlike a proud author here, and there's a lovely picture of him holding his kid, which is great. So, uh, who doesn't look particularly impressed by the book, but um, Mr. Barton does. So if you'd like to read a copy of that, then you know where to get hold of it. And there are also other lovely publications for bedtime reading or any kind of, of leisurely reading. So if you are looking to update your CPD and update your CPD bookshelf, mine is currently in a pile on my coffee table uh, with plenty to get through. But I will be adding from John Cat very soon because I've got my eye on a few things that I would like to read as well. So, Kieran, next point and I've already lost my train of thought as well because I had something I wanted to ask I'd put a pin in various things but it will it will come back to me so just to kind of revisit the few things that we have spoken about so we've we've talked about lots already we've talked about exploring maths sort of more readily uh, or more freely in in the younger years and maybe kind of you know not getting so formal so quickly um the other thing that kind of came to my mind and I don't know sort of again how you feel about this part but certainly in the in the scheme that I'm using at the moment you look at a particular area of maths so for example for us it is multiplication and division it is looking at those more <clears throat> excuse me those more formal written methods and we'll do that unit we'll work on it but then it doesn't come up again in the in that particular year it won't come up again until the following year when they when they look at it again in year six in in my case and I suppose the idea is that well you know they, they don't need to once they've done it once they've kind of got to the point that they need to get to they've and again we're going to use it in inverted commas masters what they need to some perhaps maybe more so than others but to not revisit in an entire year, is that a, a good thing or a bad thing? Because in the past, we've been told to, you know, make sure we're going back over over the important concepts, and particularly when it comes to year six and to SATs and to year two and SATs as well, that the idea that you wouldn't revise something or look back on something is is strange to, to me. No, I, th I think you're right to be reticent, sceptical, um, because we know how important retrieval practice is. We, we know... You know, 
the, the field of cognitive psychology that deals with how memories are formed and sort of stored is pretty robust. You know, the idea that, you know, you're only ever really getting performance within a sequence of lessons. It's whether or not people remember something in two months' time that really defines, you know, whether or not something has been committed to memory. And, and so I think there are very few instances where that's not the responsibility um, of the teacher. You know, so for instance, if you're using something um, that, that, that doesn't encourage or doesn't provide you with sort of retrieval opportunities, um, then you really need to think about when and where you're going to do that. Because the research into retrieval practice suggests that it doesn't actually matter what time of day, it doesn't matter if it's part of the math lesson or not. The important part is that you're trying to retrieve um, retrieve these memories because you are regenerating a new memory each time and making it a little bit more stronger in your in your schema. Um, I, I think I'd probably am wrong if I didn't say that um, the the working to complete maths, the our, our sort of uh, classroom is built around the idea that um, it will generate these retrieval opportunities for teachers. So if they use their timetable um, and say they, they mark off when things have been covered, you know, not learned, um, then you can make these date range quizzes that uh, that will sort of do the thinking for you because, you know, you have to look at the optimum spacing between retrieval opportunities. You know, if you look at Herman Ebbinghaus's uh, sort of forgetting curve and then how do we make that into the, the remembering curve? I think Adam Boxer has a really good blog where he inverts it and he shows that your retrieval opportunities, well, actually, this is how you get towards two months and still remembering something. Um, so I think foolish to ignore um, the, the wealth of, of research in that field. Um, and, you know, for me, it was a game changer when I first read about this stuff because um, sort of working with pupils who typically had sort of issues with working memory, you know, I would curse myself because, you know, I, I thought I taught them really well. Why can't they remember this? Um, and it's because I wasn't taking account of how pupils and how pupils remember things, how humans remember things and the model of memory that we that we currently have, which is, I think, really well researched in. And that's, that's not every field of uh, academic or education research that I say that about. Um, so, yeah, I, th I think you are right. Your trepidations are justified because uh, those those re revisit opportunities, particularly with the operations, you know, because you teach year three about multiplication and division, um, typically, and to expect them to have that cracked, you know, I'm, I'm happy if they've got that cracked by the time they finish year six, really, um, because you've got some of the most complex mathematics outside of fractions that they will uh, that they'll encounter you know so i'm i'm 100% with you oh you mentioned fractions i am i every year i i dread it coming up whatever year group i'm teaching because i still haven't cracked how to get how to get children to understand certain concepts within fractions but i think also that it it goes to show that actually there are so many other things that need to come first before fractions even come in come into the into the <clears throat> mix sorry my voice is, is cracking up slightly Kieran I'm also going to ask you to do me a favor and all the things that you have uh, mentioned all the various research papers if you can remember them please do um, add them to uh, a tweet or uh, to the show notes for for this this evening and we will retweet it out because I'm sure that there's some reading material in there that people will want to catch up on and there are quite a few uh, people who have joined us this evening, um, some other ones. We've got Liz in here, who uh, is, um, what kind of teacher are you, Liz? You are a year one teacher, so I'll be very interested in all the things we've said there. Um, we've got Sarah Heavens in. We've got all sorts of people. And to those of you listening and thinking that you would maybe like to be in the chair doing what I'm doing and the other hosts at Teachers Talk Radio are doing, then please do drop us a line. We are always looking for new hosts we'd love to have you on board with us it's great fun and you get to choose your topics you get to invite your own guests on you are in control of your show it's really fantastic and i have done this now for uh, a year and a half and it has helped me build confidence it has helped me meet fantastic people like kieran and get to talk about all areas of education and learn things that I maybe otherwise wouldn't have done or definitely in some cases otherwise wouldn't have done so if you are sitting there listening in this evening thinking do you know what I can do that then go ahead and send us a dm via twitter and uh, 
who knows? It could be you sitting here having a conversation or having a chat about an area of education that you are interested in. So go forth and make sure you get in touch. So what else? <laughs> yes, thank you for the laughter there. Admin's laughing at me because they, uh, they're, they, <laughs> they're wanting to make sure that, uh, that I get that in there this evening. So uh, thank you for that. Anywho, losing lines of thought as always. So, Karen, where do we get to? See, this is what happens. We get to this point in the show. We get to about half an hour before the end, and I really start to lose it because everything's happening, brains all over the place, trying to remember lots of things. But uh, we got to where? What was the last thing we mentioned? Oh my gosh, Karen, you're going to have to help me out here. Uh, so you were slightly reticent about the um, was the strengths and weaknesses of different different options perhaps i think would probably be the, the general way to describe it uh oh gosh what was it it was um no it was talking about oh no not revisiting things that was it not revisiting things and uh, not, re- not yeah. revisiting certain concepts so because we've had i mean some of the feedback i would argue that at the moment i mean because my school changed we only changed over to the current scheme we're using this academic year and that we just kind of that was it there was sort of no no kind of conversation about it it was just okay here you go and off you go and so finding sort of all these things out along the way like the fact that things aren't revisited but then the sort of the feedback we've had from um, some parents for example is that well why are you spending so long on certain areas and this I suppose is almost the the, the sort of the, the other half to the to the worry about not revisiting in that well how come you're in your third week of, of doing multiplication surely you should have moved on and I suppose the idea is well that we're kind of you know turning it inside out going through it this that and the other so the idea being hypothetically in the case of these schemes is that you don't have to revisit because you've done it so thoroughly the first time so um i i don't know how to how to address that because i'm in the same camp as you i think that things should be looked at and then revisited again and explored in different ways and 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 shown how they relate to one another so for example you know the fact that place value for example comes up in absolutely or almost absolutely everything else you you do and how that all links together but you know, in the meantime, you've got people in your ear sort of saying, well, actually, you know, I think you should have moved on. Uh, I mean, it depends who's saying that. Um, you know, I think if, you know, I, I've never really had the experience of parents giving me advice on which part of the curriculum I'm in. I know there's different different contexts. <laughs> and, you know, if you're in Portugal, perhaps in a, in a fee-paying yeah. school, um, might be more common. Um, don't want to make broad generalizations, but certainly the people who I've spoken to and maybe interviewed on Tadapi about uh, the independent sector will talk about a different set of pressures sure. than, uh, than you might find elsewhere. Um, so if, if it's apparent, I'd reassure them that, uh, that you're the expert or I'm the expert and that uh, that your child is making you know sufficient progress. Um, I think if you're on week 15, maybe even less than that, week eight, say, of, of fractions and um, things aren't moving along well it might be that a break might be um, the best thing so you can think well what isn't directly related to this that can give us some uh, almost like a sorbet and you know refresh our palate and then we'll come back and we'll try the, <laughs> I love that. this later on <laughs> and you know because you, you you could just um you could bang you know the nail until it's uh until it's gone through the other side um, and you know it, it might not be any good, you know. So I think it's about being reflective and um, and responsive, you know. So I, I don't think there is too long, um, but I think we need to use our professional judgment um, and reassure um, sort of stakeholders that uh, that we know exactly what we're doing. And I always talk to teachers about understanding the why that they do things. That's the most important thing. For instance. If you're a teacher and you have uh, you're taking part in an Ofsted inspection, um, there's a there's a very good chance that you have more expertise than the inspector when it comes to primary mathematics. And so, being able to articulate the decisions you've made, um, why you've made them, is, is really really powerful. Now, this was probably more important um, six seven years ago before the sort of frequent uh, what are the framework changes started coming into place because there was a while 
were sort of our best bets for helping people learn weren't necessarily um, on the, you, you would have been pushing against the grain if you were employing these strategies. And so you needed to be able to articulate, I've made this decision. You might not see what, um, you might not see performance in this, in this, or you might not see uh, learning because you can't track learning in this lesson. But I know that several months down the line, we're going to be, we're going to be fine. You know, I think it's, it's probably different if you've got a, a teacher as a parent, but I think most teachers are self-aware enough to know that um, all that's really important is that your child is happy because um, you've got a teacher for a parent and you probably had a really, really enriched upbringing, you know, if not affluently, but certainly um, socially and uh, all the things that you'd want a child, the experience of a child to have in the, in the first place. So if you're a teacher and you're giving your, your child's a teacher um, pressure, you know, maybe think about it, but I don't think anyone does that. No. <laughs> and uh, it, I mean, yeah, I mean, the uh, it's it's very hard when they are breathing down your neck. It, it, it is it is true. And I think that but I also think that the, there's a, maybe a communication aspect and reassuring them that actually, yes, you know, we we've uh, as a school invested in a particular scheme that we're hoping that is going to you know, enrich children's lives and, and their progress in maths. And we're going to you know, make sure that we use it effectively and don't all the rest. Um so yeah that's a tricky one so for the sort of kind of final part of this if you like although i appreciate we'll probably go off on several more tangents in the meantime so i say final with a with a sort of hint of uh, or a grain of salt but in amongst all of this and all these approaches and everything we've talked about the um you sort of touched on this the the sort of the the teacher training the the cpd side certainly in uh, utilizing the schemes that we've talked about but for for maths more generally I mean I certainly I don't I think I I don't I think I've had, had maybe one math CPD session in my entire seven year career which is a bit of an embarrassing um, thing to, to admit I mean that's sort of through places that I've worked I've done my own my own research and my own reading and obviously hosted this show this evening but in terms of this style of, of teaching and moving it forward I've definitely read and I think it was on a, a third space learning blog that in order to implement uh, a sort of mastery style of of teaching you have to have teachers who understand what what that is what that means and how you know how it is how it is implemented because without that as a as a starting point then it can't it can't go any further yeah i think no matter what pedagogical approach you have this the cpd that you give to your teachers both in terms of subject knowledge and pedagogical knowledge i think is is the driving factor mm -hmm. between to you know the deciding factor in terms of how things will be actualized how they'll be realized in the classrooms you know um so like if I'm talking to subject leaders, I'm talking to them about how whatever model they've they've chosen, whatever the pedagogic model within their sort of chosen resource is, it needs to represent what how they see mathematics being enacted. And then from there, they can support their teachers in sort of realizing that ambition. And I think, yeah, like going back to go back to thinking, and um, you know, we really need to consider what is it we want. How you know, because there are many, many ways to teach mathematics. You know, if you look at different states in America, um, you know, we consider America to be this single homogenous block. But actually, if you look at their education systems and the, you know, the the variation between states, the variation between counties within states, um, you know, but they're all having similar levels of success. And um, so, to an extent, it's really about your implementation. That it that is sort of the most important thing because you know you can take a horse to water but you also need to give the the, the horse the capacity to drink i mean that, that analogy falls down pretty quickly so i'll probably never make that again and um, but essentially um you know uh, we got to think about well where do we want our teachers to be in five years time and what are the steps we need to do to get them there just like plan a lesson yeah. w what's the end goal of this and then you're working backwards, what steps do we need to take to get there? Almost definitely. You know, for instance, 
Sorry. No, no, um, I was going to. I was just going to ask you just uh, on that. Sorry, I'm no I'm cutting off your train of thought here, which I will regret because I, I don't want you to forget what you're saying. But in amongst all of this as well, just and it feeds into this whole idea of, of training teachers and CPD or all the rest of it. Um, do you think there's still a fear, a, a sort of a fear among primary teachers about teaching maths? Well, do you think it's still that subject that people are are afraid of, and maybe that's also something that needs to be overcome before we go any further. I can't remember the last time I looked at the figures, but I think 3% at most is the number of people teaching primary who will have studied, I can't remember if it was degree level or A-level, um, but, you know, maths degrees aren't high um, amongst the, the teaching population, you know? So you're not starting necessarily. Um, and I know expertise doesn't necessarily equate to eff efficacy in the classroom, um, but I, I I think you're right. The the reticence to engage with mathematics, and um, you know, where we're in a world where it's or certainly a culture that it's socially acceptable to say that you're not good at maths, despite the um, it, there's no way anyone would claim out loud with pride that they were illiterate, but not being a maths person is acceptable. And so I I do think we exist in a world where. We need to think about this, the subject knowledge, um, and there there are polite ways to do it. You know, we can make sure that teachers are being supported bit by bit, um, in developing their subject knowledge. But I, I think that's that's the reality is that um, we're we're not a, a collection of, of mathematics experts. Um, and you know, one of the one of the things I would do in my training is have almost equal parts mathematics with with the pedagogy. And so, if I was introducing some pedagogy. I think about, well, what mathematics will my teachers collectively be teaching on the horizon? And then I would use that to furnish my examples. And um, so that indirectly, we're becoming better mathematicians ourselves, um, but also becoming better teachers, hopefully, if, I, if my CPT is, it was successful, and which I think it was. So yeah, I, I, you know, that's a long way of saying, yeah, I think the reality you describe is, the, is still as prevalent now as it was uh, you know 10 15 years ago and it's 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 sad as well and i think that there are still um well, fact, i know for a fact that there are parents who instill that in their children as well this idea of well you know i wasn't very good at math so i i can't help you with any homework or i can't kind of have have any any input here and it's 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 sad to me because i mean it took becoming an adult and and training to teach for it to for it to change for me but my big wish and i say this to to my my colleagues as well is that if I can in any way support colleagues so that they can feel like I do now about maths I, I feel like that's a that's a, a job well done but for me there's still so much to, I mean there's always so much to to learn in in terms of in terms of CPD and I think the danger that occurs is these it's easy to buy into a scheme and we've touched on this earlier in the show it's easy to buy into a scheme to say oh we're using whichever one it is and uh, that that be that and uh, the, I suppose the the sadness for me is that that takes the the creativity and the possible ideas of, of exploration out of it because if you've got again if you've got a perfectly in theory, functional scheme. Why would you need to kind of branch out from that? And I suppose the the the, the CPD that I would would want is knowing number one, knowing how to implement my math teaching effectively. That's the most important thing. Making sure that what I'm teaching is and the what I'm teaching is the right thing, and I'm equipping children with the skills that they need. But to then branch out from that, and again, I think this is where that, that fear or that lack of understanding comes, comes in as well, in that if you said to a teacher, how, you know, how would you extend this or how would you approach this in a creative way, most of them couldn't, couldn't tell you. So what, you know, where would you tell people to, to look for inspiration or how would you inspire them to say actually you can do this differently this isn't just about standing at the front teaching children how to use a particular method and leaving it at that there are ways and means to to make it exciting and how how in your mind would I'm not articulating this very well I realize this but where has your creativity taken you I suppose would be my my question here 
Yeah, that's, that's fair. Um, I think, you know, for me, maths is intrinsically exciting. Um, so, you know, I don't think we need to dress it up. Um, you know, I think back to my teaching practice and the, those teachers who did really well, you know, they, there would be a propensity for displays and for dressed up as historical figures to teach history lessons. And um, I don't necessarily subscribe to that school of, uh, of pedagogy. Um, but I think mathematics in itself, when you outline the um, the beauty and you allow pupils the opportunity to get there um, then, and to make those realisations and these profound truths that exist within the, the primary national curriculum. And I think that's where the excitement comes from. And also, like I said, when you're, when you're working towards proof and generalisation, you know, the reward that you, um, you know, that hard graft paying off brings you, you know, it's, it's a massive endorphin rush when you think, yeah, that, that was totally worth the effort. And that being said, you don't want your chosen curriculum, your sort of pedagogy to be a straitjacket. Um, and I think w- uh, managers in school need to take uh, responsibility for that in ensuring the teachers don't feel that uh, that's, that the curriculum is a straitjacket, that we have to open up page 23, do page 23, and that's it. You know, I think it, it connects to everything we've been saying so far this evening in terms of if you've got really r- robust subject knowledge, if you know your curriculum inside out, if you've been supported in developing your pedagogy, then you will have the confidence to say, OK, I know where we can take this next. Um, and although, you know, for instance, something like the addition of three consecutive numbers, it's not all singing, all dancing. But the proof that you arrive at at the end and the fact that you can use Numicon, you know, one of the things that Numicon can be used to prove or to show really well is this idea of the addition of, of consecutive numbers and the generalization you can come to at the end. Um, and so for me, it, it goes back to really understanding your craft really well. Um, and I think you're, you're, originally you were sort of asking the question about, well, where do you go to in this, in this situation? Um, and I, I sort of asked the question, well, what do we do with our pupils? We give them lots of examples. Um, and we show them examples and non-examples. So, for instance, you might go to the work of Gareth Metcalf and you might ask your teachers, well, why has Gareth designed the task like this? What, what decisions has he made here? And can we design a task that's similar to this, but not identical? And then that way you're using examples to furnish pu- your teachers with what will become their own ideas. You know, So experience and expertise are on a continuum. I would definitely um, sort of invest more in the examples with sort of more novice teachers um, and more freedom for those teachers who have seen it and have thought about this a million times. Because essentially what you want this mental model of what mathematics can be. And so despite making thousands of decisions in a day, you know you're making the right decisions because you've made them a hundred times before. And again, that comes from staying in the classroom, seeing the value of staying in the classroom um, and getting really, really expert. Um, you know, if we go back to Singapore, um, it's the, the teachers who've been in the class 30, 40 years, they teach the pupils who struggle the most. And, and I think that's what we should be aiming for as a system. Um, and we, we create that system through, by furnishing teachers with examples and asking them about those examples, just like we would with our, with our pupils. I think that's fantastic. And, you know, in it's going to sound really nasty saying this and really blindingly obvious, but in inspiring teachers to go and look for those examples and, and create those own things and create their own examples rather and, and drive forward these, these ideas, it's going to push them and inspire them to, to be you know, best teachers. But then also, you know, inspirational teaching makes for kids who are then inspired and hopefully want to take maths forward in, in their lives, not just as something that's just kind of, oh, you know, you do for an hour a day. Uh, and that's that. And I think, you know, that that is the 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 trap and the straitjacket, as you say, that I feel a little bit like I'm falling into at the moment in just trying to get to grips with how we're, we're doing maths at school at, at the moment. And well, there's nothing kind of intrinsically wrong with it. It just to me feels like there are holes and ways of doing things differently and making the time there's also that making the time to ensure that actually you know I could explore this further with them or I could look at uh, a certain style of question in more detail or I could make sure that my uh, my ones who don't necessarily need the input from me do have that investigation and not putting so much time pressure 
on ourselves. And it's so easy, particularly when it is, uh, particularly in primary, I, fi- I find this to just kind of get into sort of the, the throes of, okay, well, you know, I've done my maths lesson, that's now, now done, then on to the next thing. And it's certainly given me some food for thought in, in, in what you said, and I hope it's given other people food food for thought uh, as well. So I think that's, that's, no, that's really interesting. Um, and uh, please do, I'm going to remind you again, Kieran, I'm sure you've already said, you know, yes, Lucy, I know, but please do, uh, if you can remember everything that you've talked about and uh, all the various uh, things you've referred to, please do uh, put them into a tweet, because I, I'm definitely after some... Uh, and bedtime reading and i'm sure there'll be other people in here who will want to 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 read and uh to look at their their math teaching and think about things a little bit differently so yes please lots lots of tweets post show <laughs> awesome um, i mean i'll try my very best to remember i think if you go to my website which is thinkingdeeply.info all of the resources um or all the all the re- references that are digitized from thinking deeply about primary mathematics are on a, on a page on that website. Um, okay. And so for to- to- totally free, you can go and click on it um, because I'm going to have trouble unless it's recorded, trying to remember. Yeah, and I, I don't really expect you to go back through and listen to listen to it again to, to, to unpick everything. And I'm sure some of them I, I have I have remembered, so that's that's good as well. So sort of in summary this evening, if we can kind of think back that far, because I know we've gone all over the place, what trying to think how to how to include this myself so what would be i suppose your advice to and this i suppose really goes more towards because we've kind of talked more about primary maths uh this evening what would be your advice to to teachers going forward in terms of their their teaching of of maths more generally if say they're kind of a little bit afraid they sort of got as most schools do this this scheme that they kind of stick to as a bit of a safety net and aren't really sure kind of how to how to to go for what be a sort of a where would you, what would you say to them as kind of if you can give a kind of succinct piece of advice so uh, should i imagine these teachers are in an island they're not supported by um this the staff in school and they need to get better themselves are we talking about taking charge of our professional development or are we in a, in, a, in a micro system or an ecosystem that uh, that supports them in getting better the way it should do i i i hope that I, i'm gonna i'm gonna be uh positive and go for the latter awesome cool so then the the journey should be mapped out and they should be getting pretty effective feedback from some form of coaching but if you're very eager to improve your your cpd and um, then i think little and often is the best way to um, to approach the consumption of new material for instance i use like a habit tracking app um, and it just says read one page of an education book every day now, obviously you read more than that um, but i would i would build up a habit of doing something every day i think the, the CPD college from Complete Maths, and um, I mean, definitely get your school to buy it instead of yourself. It's like £82 a year, and there's a couple of hundred uh, CPD videos that come in small chunks. And so if you're interested in getting better, like you were saying about fractions, well, <laughs> Johnny Hall does does several uh, courses on Cuisinart rods. And what it does is it gives you info in the videos and then tasks to, to sort of test out with your class, and so to speak. Um, but I think in terms of general advice... Um, it would be to be really specific about what you want to get better at and then focus in on that one thing. Just like sort of the, the literature around teacher development and early career teachers uh, is focused on now. Um, if we try to improve everything at once, we're, we're going to be less successful than if we think about one element of our practice. And then only give yourself a hard time for that one piece. You know, um, And I, I always say, like, uh, you know, a bad decision hasn't destroyed the universe yet um, in the classroom, you know, about the classroom hasn't destroyed the universe yet. So it's not likely to. So also give yourself a break, but um, but focus on one thing at a time. And then by the time you get to the end of year five, year 10 um, of this journey, you know, you won't recognize the person that you used to be and you'll think that you had all this, uh, this, this pedagogical might um, for a, a long time, you know, and you know, I think that's with anything in life, break things down and make them habitual and uh, and then piece by piece 
build the version of yourself in the classroom that you that you want oh most definitely and i think there's a lot to be said for for sharing you know cpd amongst your colleagues as well and sharing books and things like that and uh I mean, this is a, a whole kind of separate conversation, but fostering that culture of, hey, look at this, check this out. Hey, you know, I'm reading this or I'm doing this or, hey, you know, let's get together and talk about this. And I think it happens in, in some schools and, and less in others. And the idea that, um, you know, we can we can support each other in this journey, I think, is, is so is so important because although, you know, we we see our colleagues every day and, you know, with, when you're in that classroom, it, you know, you are alone, you are by yourself with with those kids. And it's it can be quite overwhelming, particularly with a subject you're not confident with. But then when you step out again and you realize that actually you do have that support. And as you say, you know, those ecosystems that exist where you can support one another to, to get better and to move forward with a subject, particularly something as important as maths that is taught every day up and down the land up and down all the lands so I think that's that's a, a great and really uh, positive approach and I'm certainly going to because I did actually say that one of my sort of new year uh, goals uh, was to was to read more and was to try and just uh, get better at certain things but I think as you say I, I I overwhelm myself and I think a lot of people do and think oh gosh I've got to digest all this information in one go but a page at a time, I think that's a really, really great approach. And, uh, and maybe, maybe it's time for, for a habit tracker as, as well. <laughs> and I should say, there's one thing that you should do above all else, and that's listen to education podcasts and radio shows because, uh, you know, maybe listen to them three or four times, you know, if, if you have the time in the car. <laughs> uh, well, on that note, this show is actually going to be turned into a podcast, which is great. So that will be available via all the, the usual platforms about in about 24 to 48 hours, depending on how quickly we can turn it around. So hopefully those who've missed out this evening, Kieran, can can listen back and be inspired by by listening to you and the the advice and the the journey that you've taken us on this evening which has been hugely helpful to me as well so thank you very very much indeed no it's my pleasure i mean i'm just happy i wasn't heckled because whenever i heard about what space this was i thought <laughs> this could go horribly wrong <laughs> well fortunately for you the the teachers talk radio crowd tend to be uh, a pretty a pretty good a pretty good bunch i think uh, admin would agree i think i'm sure they'll give me a thumbs up or a heart to to show their their acknowledgement at the moment yeah thumbs up see there you go <laughs> no it's it's a it's a lovely community and it's it's a great great thing to to be a part of but i think looking at the time that's about all we've got time for this evening i mean i could go on and on and on kieran as i'm sure you you could as well and hopefully mm -hmm. we will get <laughs> another chance to to revisit this in the future but yes people will get a chance to listen to this again it is available for 30 days via this link but it will also be podcasted and we will tweet that out as well along with all the other things we've talked about or what we can remember so there'll be a lot of uh, a lot of information flying around over the next couple of days which hopefully people will take on board uh, not be too overwhelmed by and put to fantastic use so once again kieran thank you so much for joining me and for braving twitter spaces i hope that well it sounds like you've enjoyed the experience so maybe we'll get you back again at some point um if uh, if you'd agree to to such things yeah definitely it's been a pleasure oh, thank you very much fabulous. for having me thank you so much really enjoyed it so all that remains for me to say this evening is thank you all very much for joining me i hope it's been as inspirational for you as it has for me I will be back again next week and next week I'm going to hopefully be looking at parts of the English curriculum. So switching subjects. So if any of you are interested in talking to me about particularly about writing uh, at key stage two at primary level, if any of you or if you know somebody with that area of expertise, please send them in my direction because I'm very intrigued to to look at writing and whether children are writing enough in primary school, what good writing looks like. So, yes, anybody that you think might be good for that, or if indeed you think you'd like to be my guest, please do get in touch with me via Twitter, DMs, or just send me a tweet. That'd be fabulous. Um, in the meantime, have a fantastic rest of the week. Look after yourselves. Be good. And, uh, yeah, get some reading done in your spare time if you can. Bye, everybody. You've 
been listening to Teachers Talk Radio. Tune in live and listen back at ttradio.org. We look forward to hearing from you next time on Teachers Talk Radio.